Hey everyone, Nick Cohen here. Here's another video I did with um, a fellow author, a QA I did for the Lesbian Fiction Book Club. Um, it's the author's name is Natasha Rose, and this is an interview with her specifically in relation to her book, The Queen's Blade. Hope you enjoy. Let me know in the comments. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hey, everyone. Uh, Neen Cohen here, and I'm here to introduce the amazing Natasha Rose, who is the author of, once I actually pull it up, of The Queen's Blade. Yay. Yay, fantastic. Um, Natasha is an Australian author who's been writing for forever, um, <laughs> and she's written, yeah, <laughs> she's, been, she's written several series and standalones, which I'm devastated to hear that. The Queen's Blade is a standalone, but we'll get into that soon. Um, all right, so fantastic. Let's get into it. Um, first question The Queen's Blade is set in your own world, influenced by mythology and gods. Is this something you had to look up for research, or is this something you've always had a passion for? Um, I've always had a passion for mythology and history. Uh, there are a couple of things I did need to research because they're outside my usual areas of, of obsession. Um, but a lot of it I already knew and have been re researching and reading about. Um, as you can well, sort of see, this is based off an ancient Greek kiton. Um, I'm part of I'm part of several historical reenactment groups, so I had the costumes ready. <laughs> That's fantastic. And do you remember how all that passion started or where it came from? Um, I think it was this. I think it was one of those books that I'd got handed for Christmas to keep me sitting down and quiet. I suppose by <laughs> um, My parents found out fairly early on that handing me a book was a way to get me to sit on the couch and, and still and in one place. <laughs> that sounds like that, that, that's a pretty good. Good thing so though. They figured world, it out. <laughs> yeah. I got a world mythology book when I was like six or seven, I think. Um, and it had the basic mythologies of from all around the world. And then it got then I just got, hmm. Let's go look let's go read more on this. Wow, that's fantastic. Oh, that'd be so nice if people realised that, you know, some kids will just be happy with the book. <laughs> um there was a board game by Jove that was we had in our primary school um, for rainy for rainy day lunch times, um, which is the Roman version of Greek mythology. Um, and of course, when you've got a bunch of young pre preteen boys, they'll, they'll be making stupid jokes about stuff. And I was officially not allowed to correct them. Oh, was, then we'd be there all lunchtime while I explained exactly how they were wrong. Wow. <laughs> That's hilarious. Mm. All right, let's get into the Queen's Blade itself. Um, all right, so Talia is without a doubt my favourite character. <laughs> I, I just I just wanted to know so much more about her and how how her perspective might have been growing up as the half sister, you know, and. Um, was she based on anyone specific, real life or mythical? Um, a little bit on the twin relationship that I had with, with my own twin. Um, I didn't base I didn't base her specifically on my sister, but um, there's a bit of that. I can trust you to be there through anything and everything. That I think bled in a bit more, perhaps a bit more than I intended. Um, with Talia, it's kind of very, it's it's very dual. She doesn't have the weight of duty that Alexandra does, but at the same time, she's very much not on the same level as her sister. So she doesn't have the whole, um, you have, you're an important uh, marriage alliance for the future, get used to it now. Um, so there's a lot less weighing on her, but there's also, um, so she can just be in be in the background and um, take the pressure off in a couple of ways, but at the same time, it's still a, a a duty that she has in in ways to be her sister's backup. 
Yeah, the connection between them two is beautiful through the whole book. You, you absolutely, you will always be there no matter what. Spoilers. Um. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. Um, it it comes across, and I just I love that dynamic. Absolutely. Um, she's just. Uh, it just. Yeah. She was just right. brilliant. <laughs> I love her. <laughs> um. So the ending of the book, spoilers, everyone. Who, if you haven't read it yet, I'm I'm sorry, but there will be spoilers. I need to know. Um, so at the end of the book, I was so sure it was going to be the first of a series because I'm like, oh come on, like we could see the girls in training, we can see them on the island. Are there any intentions for this at all? Well, it would be the first time I thought I had a standalone that then turned into a series. <laughs> at this exact moment, not yet. There's no solid plans, but there is plans for a book of side stories that will explore different perspectives, um, things that we didn't see in in the book itself. So, like how exactly Alexandros got with two goddesses at the same time, um, <laughs> resulting in Thalia and and Alexandra. Um, what it was like for them growing up. Um, as two very young princesses in the in the absence of a male heir, um, a bit more on Sophia growing up and when she starts her little um, training school. There's totally not a training school, except it totally is. Yeah, <laughs> it totally is. Well, they had to have some use for the lovers' palace. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the official mistress residence wasn't getting used by anyone at that point. So why not turn it into school for the Technically not a mistress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I loved that. There was this sort of not is uh we're just not <laughs> gonna say and we're just gonna we're just gonna live and be happy and yeah. it was heart heartbreaking having to watch from um from the perspective and just see it and there's a line that you wrote about this is a, a whole new type of torture and I'm like yep I could only imagine the torture of Sophia having to sit there and watch it all and yeah yeah that was breaking <laughs> so um, I, the thing the thing was I realized fairly early on that look if if I'm going to have a queen who's been resisting all attempts for um, a more suitable man to take over her throne, then at some point she's going to need an heir. And that's going to suck in a lot of ways. So I had it planned out that this was going to be an absolutely political marriage. We're, get we're getting an heir, then we're sleeping in separate, separate wings of the palace. Um, but it wasn't until I actually started writing it that I realised, oh, wow, this is going to suck for, for both of you. Yep. <laughs> well, it's, uh, I realised just how much it was going to suck, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, it's um very much a commentary on that, that balance mm. of expectations and what, what someone wants versus their responsibilities. And mm. damn, <laughs> you yeah. don't give them, you know, you, you, you put it through the rigour a little bit, which is, yeah. is good, though. Well, I think, I think, I think, I think, I, Sorry, I think I see a lot in a lot of fantasy romances, well, especially fantasy romances, but fantasy in general, is throwing out is just the heroine gets to marry their completely unsuitable true love and live happily ever after. But I don't really see very often exploring what happens when that's not an option. Yeah. Like, well, oh, true love saves the day and everything. But you don't see, you don't see very many cases where, um, the heroine or the protagonist has to marry someone more suitable and then work around that because a lot of the, a lot of the writers groups i mean on facebook will have someone saying um hey i need to work out this relation this relationship bit um they're from, from two very different stations how do i make this work and a lot of people will say oh it's fine throw politics out the window um have them marry, marry their true love, you realise that's going to bring down the entire kingdom, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Like, I love that it. Woodcutter's son, 
A, he's going to get executed the first, as, soon as, as soon as the king sends his guards out. Mm -hmm. um, but B, uh, you realise you just created a succession crisis and there's going to be problems. Yeah. No, the best thing about the Queen's, Queen's Land is it does go into those, the realistic ideas of of the world you've created. Like, she can't simply mm. have Sophia um, because she has so much more responsibility. I do love that you still make. I love that you still make. There is a happily for now, at least you know there is the there is still the happiness for them, but it's yeah. not. It's not um, you know. Many, yeah, in many ways, both of them have responsibilities that mean they can't. Like, Sophia swore vows of chastity, and if she, and as the first open female assassin active in active in the world everyone's looking at her to see how this works out if she mm. why, if she just breaks her vows because of love that's a giant weapon of this is why we don't have female assassins that she's just handed everyone who says she can't so right. in many ways she has to be like um being sweet talked into being alexandra's bodyguard or rather um semi-threatened into being Sophia's bodyguard instead of trying to, continuing to try and kill her. Um, yeah. Sorry, Alexander's bodyguard. Um, Sophia can throw the, can basically wave being a bodyguard as a ha-ha, fuck you, I'm better. Yeah. Um, <laughs> at everyone who said girls can't be assassins. But yeah. if she's suddenly marrying, marrying the person she was sent to kill, this is a giant and like settling in as a kept mistress. This is a giant, this is why we don't let girls be assassins, see what she just did. That she's handed everyone who's told her that she couldn't that she couldn't do it. So in many ways, Sophia is just as bound by duty and responsibility and social and well not social expectations, but other people's expectations as Alexandria is. Very true. Very true. Absolutely. It's um such a intense dynamic like mm -hmm. you can read so much more into all the levels of it and that's what i i loved about the book i also loved the uh, oomph factor where you build up all these things with power and and then you just quietly pull the rug out from under them um and oh, it yeah. just kind of you just go w what oh okay and <laughs> it just you know they, they almost get not casual but such confidence in their powers and their skills and what they're capable of and to suddenly come up against something that they hadn't come up against before and all of a sudden all this confidence is kind of ripped away from them and mm. it's it's very impactful <laughs> yeah it's it's partly um Partly because, like every every superpower you build in, you need to have a weakness as well. Absolutely. Like, like I've, I'd already put in that. Yes, Alexandra can stop an army, a small army, in its tracks, but it's going to knock her unconscious for a week afterwards. Yeah, there has to like, be a balance. There has to be a payoff of some kind, whether it's in power, whether it's in energy, whether it's I can do this once, but I'll never be able to do the same feat again because it'll just it'll take too much, and I'll never reach that level. I'll never go back to that level. Or in some cases, then there has to, for ev well, it's it's a bit light and dark. For every thing, there has to be something that can negate it. Um, so, war and peace. For every for every peace, there's something that can, there, well, there's war or chaos that will knock it that will knock it for a loop. And I I I I've written that in fairly early, but in a very subtle way. So yes. Because the thing is, even with superheroes, there's some, Superman's got kryptonite. There's always something that that has that can make them non superpowered. Absolutely, and there has to be. There has to be something to yeah. keep that balance. Otherwise, it's just do sex ex machina, just bulldozing your way through things. Yeah, and that makes a very good story. No. <laughs> I'm I'm so excited about the, the future stories that are coming. Um about some of the other characters and that stuff. I'm 
so excited about it. Um, but going back to what you were saying um, earlier, yep. what, uh, what books did you actually read as a kid that did inspire you to become an author? That didn't, didn't just inspire your love of things, but actually make you want to be an author? Um, I actually don't know. Like some of my earliest writing memories were being given a blank book for like coloring while mum and well, while my mum and my mother were playing tennis, um, and we were just given like a one of those blank um, scrapbooks. Yeah, yeah, and most and most of it was most of it was used to like draw pictures. But I'd find myself writing a few. Uh, a few very badly written lines. <laughs> Admittedly, I was like five, five at this point. Um, yeah. <laughs> so a bunch of question lines of questionable skill, um, telling a story at the same time. So I don't know. I don't know if there was any one thing. Just I always had stories in my head that I wanted to tell, um, and whether they came out in um, acting them out when we didn't have a TV or fan fiction later on in my teens or. That's that's cool. I, yeah. I love hearing about you know memories like that where it just I don't like, think the there stories were always there. I don't think it went to any particular books that made me think, "Hey, I want to be a writer." Just I like writing. I want to be one. Um, that's fantastic. And I was lucky to have supportive parents who didn't say, "Ha ha ha, that's stupid." Um, <laughs> they did tell me, "Don't give up your day job," which was honestly the best <laughs> advice I've ever received. Um, but no one ever told me. Why would you? Why would you want to do that? Which I think a That's lot of good. a lot of young writers don't necessarily get. Like, you hear all about famous ones who got this, who were worked in grocery stores, um, or or as doctors or something else because their parents made them get a job that would pay the bills for before indulging their creativity. Um, and I think like. Of course, you've got the ones who actually got their start in journalism and, and, and short fiction writing and then blew up. But but I think the best advice any any person who wants to write is go ahead um, and then just keep your day job. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, well, so you have a new book out that you have just released a few days ago. Is that right? On Australia Day. Oh wow! Um, and that's called the Time Travelers IT. Yep. Is that right? And that's yep. part of a series. Yes, yep. it started out with a Tumblr prompt that was basically, "Can you imagine being the poor person who has to clothe all the people, all the time travelers, so that they don't <laughs> stick out the poor thumb?" So I wrote a short novelette on basically that prompt. Um, there's a lot of you did what to my hand painted silk. <laughs> And no, we can't send you to that time period wearing wearing something from like three decades earlier. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that um, sounds fantastic. No, no, no. Spanish gable hoods were Catherine of Aragon, not Catherine Parr. <laughs> yes, fashion oh. the head. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, that's great. And so this is the is this the no, this is the third one though, isn't it? Yeah. So I I expected the time travel seems to just be a fun little novelette that that I'd sell out of it um, at reenact our festivals and things like that. Um, and I did. And then I got swamped by fans who'd been pointed my way by a friend of mine who'd been sniggering through my trying to blend into the walls while everyone was raving about it. <laughs> um, and basically got cornered and asked, "So when's the sequel coming out?" Hadn't actually planned on a sequel, but <laughs> um, but I got ideas, and then the time traveler's accountant came out. So this is the time traveler's accountant is is the people who are stuck trying to find workable um, methods for people to pay for their time traveling agents to pay for things, and also do a lot of shouting when um, when said agents lose their entire stock of tenth century coins to a pickpocket. And yes, I'm going to make you get back in that time machine and retrieve them. I don't care how long it takes you. <laughs> oh, excellent. 
And so um, this third one's about the IT, is that right? Um, hello, have you tried turning your time machine on and off again? <laughs> what do you mean you hit the big shiny red button with two with, with do not push on it? <laughs> How do you blow up Portal 6? We specifically idiot proofed it against agents. <laughs> oh, these are great. Um, I'm really looking forward to them. They sound fantastic. Um, it's, it's basically finding, jumping on Facebook and asking all my friends, so why do you look on this? What, what are your most common workplace complaints? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's very good call. Yeah, absolutely. Ask the hive <laughs> mind sort of thing. And so yeah, what are so you, what are you working on? <laughs> so what are you working on at the moment? Um, at the moment, I've just started the Time Travellers HR, with, who are the poor people in, well, HR and recruitment, one of one of them will be book four, one of them will be book five, which are the poor people in charge of trying to make sure that the agents and and support departments don't actually kill each other. <laughs> it's hard than it looks. Um, and the people who, are, who spend a lot of time sc scrolling through Pinterest for people who actually know what they're talking about, and a lot of time banging their heads and trying to convince people that no, BBC's Merlin is not historically accurate. Yeah. <laughs> oh gosh, that's that's fantastic. <laughs> um, no need to support it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Um, thank you so much. Is oh, there is actually something else you would like to announce, is that correct? Um oh yes, giveaways. Yes. So <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, brain went, brain went blank for a second. Um, <laughs> so for everyone who ordered a copy of the Queen's Blade between when Neen announced the um, the interview and let's say 1st of February, um, you get two giveaways. Um, send a screenshot of either the book on your Kindle or the book itself or just the purchase um, confirmation to Nina or I, and you get a bookmark, which is Alexandra and Sophia. Um, and the pin that Alexandra gave Sophia when they were doing the whole, I can't give you a ring, but have this instead. It's minus the poison dart, I'm not that good. <laughs> but it's oh, that's little, beautiful. It's your little, it's your little um, olive blossom and bud. That's gorgeous. Um, Fantastic. So if you've purchased the book, just send a mess send a screen cap to, to me, um, or Natasha, or even put it up on the um Facebook page, the either one the book um, up, that's fine. And um, send a address because I need to know where to send them. Oh yes, yes. I'll um I'll follow up on that if you do send it to me <laughs> and I'll send the information through to Natasha. Um well, thank you so much for today. This has been brilliant. And um, good luck with the Time Travellers HR. Yeah, yeah. HR. Oh, gosh. Uh, there's HR recruitment and then a final rogue. So. Oh, fantastic. So five. Wow, five books. That's amazing. Well, there'll be six in total. but Oh, gosh, six. Wow. Yeah. And oh, after that, everyone more can combine it themselves. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, fantastic. Now, just a quick um, thing. Where can people find um, your, your books? Um, so if, if you're in New South Wales, I do Ironfest, St Ives and Winterfest when they're running. Thank you, COVID. Um, yeah. You'll usually find me dressed up in some extremely eye-catchy, something extremely eye-catching and working with a bunch of other authors in a, in a store under the, under the heading Tales, Tales and Trinkets. Um, pro tip, if you're, if you're a writer who wants to do a bookstore, make sure you have a buddy, bathroom breaks are a thing. Um, otherwise jump on Amazon or other books, other online booksellers will have them through extended, expanded distribution, but Amazon is your best bet for eBooks. Um, or I have a Facebook page, Tales, Tabs and Trinkets, and my Natasha Rose author page, which is, large, which is largely memes. Um, but if you go through those, I can send you what I have in stock. Oh, fantastic. 
um what we might do is we'll put those links down in the comments um yep. so that people can find it later that might be brilliant all right well cool. thank you so much for today and thank you me this is cool <laughs> no problem and we will see you all later bye guys bye.